Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide the people of your church that following our Savior we may walk through the wilderness of this world for the glory of the world to come. Jesus Christ, our Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament for Invocabit is written in the first book of Moses, third chapter. 
those days, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. The Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, he shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Out of it you are taken. For dust you are. To dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Also, Adam and his wife, where God made tunics of skin, clothed them. This is the word of the Lord. This is written in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Brethren, we plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, 
as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. This is the word of the Lord. of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. At that time, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every worth, word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. And was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen.
In the name of Jesus, amen. I remember once when a couple of students from my religion class over at the school posited a question that's become a little more familiar over the years. Why did Adam and Eve listen to the devil? My response, having also become fairly familiar, was, well, why do you listen to him? Typically, that ends the discussion. It certainly did that day. Really, though, it's not such an academic question. The differences between our response to temptation, that of our first parents, and of course that of our Lord, are of primary concern on this first Sunday in Lent, a season that, as we just sang, carries the comparison to the events of the Gospel reading. So what can we say about temptation in general? Why do we listen? Well, certainly we all have our unique circumstances, our own unique desires, vices, our own individual weaknesses. The devil is the master at exploiting these, no question. And the world, with all its cares and trifles, is not in the habit of going easy on us. Our gospel puts all of this on rather dramatic display. Jesus is alone in the wilderness, and the effects of our fallen world have left him weak and weary. Jesus is hungry, and the devil promises food. Jesus is Lord of the angels, and Satan suggests wielding that power sacrilegiously. Jesus desires the hearts of all nations to be his. And the devil, in twisted logic, promises to hand it all over in exchange for a momentary lapse into blasphemy. And of course, Jesus does not listen, instead refuting these overtures. He untwists the word of God that was so manipulated by Satan's tongue. He avenges for Adam and Eve's fall, showing once and for all how temptations can and should be overcome through faithfulness to the word and direct, undiluted rebuke of the deceiver's advances. So often, though, we want to focus merely on this side of the temptation, what we've already talked about, noting the eloquence of the devil's line, his sugarcoating of the consequences. We hear the events, whether played out in Genesis 3 or Jesus' temptation, as cautionary tales of how to handle temptation in the moment right in the heat of it. But this, perhaps, at the expense of considering what comes next. Jesus remained steadfast and did not listen. But a casual observer to the whole scene might rightly have asked, so what of it? Sure, Jesus refused the devil's food and stayed true to the Father, but this only to continue in his hunger. He remained aligned with the Father's will with regard to the use of his angels, but this only left him still vulnerable to the dangers and pitfalls that surrounded him. He rejected the notion of bypassing his earthly mission for the world's salvation, and of course was rewarded with hardship, beatings, mockery, passion, and ultimately the cross. This is the later, perhaps you might say, a more passive or subtle allurement of temptation. It comes thanks to our tendency to consider the future, 
to realize that what lies on the other side of the moment of the hour of temptation will likely not bring immediate reward or relief. And second guessing, we may ask, what if faithfulness is not actually all it's cracked up to be? Dear brothers and sisters, I don't think it's any coincidence that the two Gospels that ring in Lenten Tide deal with the subjects that they do. Ash Wednesday brought Jesus' words that he indeed expect that we, his followers, will in some form or another fast, give alms, pray. Today reminds us why the notion of him expecting these things is appropriate. For if we are to take up cross and follow him, we cannot simply pick and choose when we will do so. We must, in our daily lives, be willing to do so as he did in the wilderness, in the face of temptation, in peril of death, and most likely with no sense of worldly comfort or glory in sight. Lent, especially, I think, at this point, is intended to drive this reality home fully and to train us, both spiritually and even physically, for the road ahead. Devils do all the world fill, each threatening to tempt and devour us. And if the thought of giving up some temporal comfort for a mere 40-day stretch, let alone actual sins that we need to be getting rid of anyway, if the thought of foregoing them is too much to bear, we definitely should have reason to fear as we traverse this world with idols that may well bring us down. We will likely be all too ready to listen to the devil's seductive temptations, especially when they sound better than the thoroughly unappealing alternative. Lent reminds us that if we wish to reject the devil's offers, we must also be willing to do without those offers afterwards, going forward. To reject his promised comforts is to accept godly struggle. To refuse his brand of glory is to cling instead to humility and weakness. In short, Lent shows us that in this fallen world, there is no true joy without sorrow. No true glory without humiliation. No true life without death. It's a pattern that has been thoroughly laid out by our Lord and Savior. And for better or worse, it's a pattern which is undeniably, very recognizably cruciform in shape. Yet, of course, there's more to the story. As Matthew highlights in the last verse, then the devil left Jesus and behold, angels came and ministered. No explicit mention is made here of him receiving food. We know that the promises of earthly protection and glory were not to come. But we are told that angels, messengers from God, came and ministered to him. This indicates yet one more facet to temptation, or rather, the aftermath of temptation in this life. That despite appearances, the Lord still does not forsake us. Still does not withhold his heavenly angels charge over us. Still does not withdraw his life-giving word. This is very much a part of our road even today as well. Both in Lent and throughout the year. For that matter, throughout our lives, 
as in the midst of our temptations, the messengers of our Lord minister among us. Preach his word of comfort here and now, and serve to remind us of what is to come. We will, in six weeks' time, recount this coming glory again. Recount the moment that our Lord's passing on Satan's temptations was, as it were, vindicated. When Christ's earthly fast was exchanged for an unending heavenly feast. When the prospects of danger and death were drowned out by the herald of new resurrected life. When the shame of cross and thorny crown gave way to an eternal throne and a crown of life. The blessings of faithfulness against sin and temptation realized then in Easter triumph on the third day. And for us, one day too, in the resurrection of the dead on the last day. Dear friends, with the beginning of Lenten Tide, we are again not only called to repentance and discipline, but we're called also to share in this victory. Victory through Jesus' faithfulness that is ours even now. We share in the hunger and struggles of Jesus' humanity, but no less also in the power of his divinity to crush the serpent's head. I pray that we in turn hold faithfully to Christ, against whom all earthly glory, wealth, and happiness simply wither away. That we hunger for Christ, who is our bread of life, the bread that renders all others and all who eat them perishable. That we in turn, or that that we turn away, rather, from the devil's and the world's enticements, listening instead to the word of God's truth, ever faithful and confident in what will be his ultimate deliverance. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, for all people according to their need. Almighty and eternal God, we adore you as the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus. With the whole church on earth and the whole host of heaven, we ascribe to you honor and blessing, thanksgiving and praise. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. You created us in your own image and redeemed us with the precious blood of your Son. By your Spirit, you sanctified us and called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Grant that we may with thankful hearts receive these great mercies and express our gratitude not only with our lips but also in our lives as we give ourselves to your service and walk before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Deliver us from sin and error, from the frailties of the flesh and the allurements of the present age and the temptations of the devil. We especially commend to you today Diane, Joey, Doris, Sally, John, Anne, Kenneth, Sheila, Suzanne, Christina, Sue, Joe, Rebecca, Terry, Gail, Steve, Carol, Bob, Roland, Mary, Mildred, Jamie, Virginia, Betty, Jean, Susan, David, June, Susie, Stephanie, Allison, Rachel, Karen, Thomas, Karen, Linda, JP, Mara, Sharonda. Give us faith that works in love, hope that never disappoints, kindness that never fails, confidence in you that never wavers, patience that does not grow weary, and courage always ready to confess Christ, that we may live in your mercy, die in your peace. The same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.